Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Before we start, here's a plug for the Anatomy Gal, a channel made by my friend and colleague Natalie Wade. She's got excellent tutorials and explanations for lab materials in anatomy and physiology, even with cadavers, so it's really cool. Be sure to check out her channel and subscribe. A link is in the description below. In this video, we're going to look at the response to blood vessel injury, and we're going to frequently come back to a slide that looks like this because there's three general steps. We're actually going to cover the first two steps here in this video, and then coagulation will be a few videos after this. Okay, But actually, we're going to delve into this in a lot more detail, so hopefully you can understand what happens when a blood vessel is injured. However, what we really need to do first is understand the normal workings of a healthy blood vessel because we really need to understand what healthy blood vessels are doing before we can go to the situation where there is damage or injury. Now these blood vessels are lined by cells called endothelial cells, which are these things over here on the left side. These endothelial cells are metabolically active, they're not just static, they're not just structural, and they have many activities that really do two things. One, they keep a coagulation from happening that's unnecessary. We certainly don't need coagulation in a healthy blood vessel. And they also keep platelets from sticking together, which is what would happen in a damaged blood vessel. So just in short, they keep blood moving through this vessel in a healthy, normal way. And so let's look at some of those activities. All right, so first of all, there's a molecule called ADP. Now, normally we think of ADP or adenosine diphosphate as existing inside cells. However, platelets can actually secrete ADP into the blood. And what ADP will actually do, if it stays there and its concentration builds up, ADP causes platelets to stick together, as you see over here, kind of like that. So if we want the blood vessel to remain healthy and platelets not to stick unnecessarily, then we have to degrade this ADP. And so healthy endothelial cells have an enzyme that's anchored to their plasma membrane, and it's on the outside of the cell, called NTPDase1. Okay? This is basically just a hydrolytic enzyme that breaks ADP down into AMP. Okay? So this keeps ADP concentration in the blood low near healthy endothelial cells, and we want ADP concentration to be kept low because when it becomes high, platelets stick together. So healthy endothelial cells break down ADP with this enzyme. Sometimes you might hear this enzyme referred to as ADP phosphatase. So also these endothelial cells, they secrete a couple other substances, such as nitric oxide and a specific prostaglandin called prostacyclin or PGI2. Now the nitric oxide, hopefully you know at this point, is a vasodilator. Okay, so nitric oxide will keep uh, these blood vessels dilated as much as possible to keep blood moving through it. But also nitric oxide can serve to inhibit platelet aggregation. So that keeps the platelets not sticking together, which is what we want in an area where the blood vessels are healthy. This prostacyclin, or PGI2, uh, by itself inhibits platelet aggregation. So it prevents the platelets from sticking, again, for the same reason that we said with nitric oxide. Okay? We want the blood to keep moving. We don't want platelets to stick. We don't want blood clots forming, basically. All right? Now, there's a couple other proteins that are also anchored on the membrane of healthy endothelial cells. Okay? One of them is thrombomodulin. Okay, thrombomodulin uh, will actually bind a protein called thrombin. Okay. And in the presence of another serum protein called protein C, it actually changes the function of thrombin. That's why this is called thrombomodulin, because it modulates the function of thrombin. Thrombin normally will cause blood clots because it converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which is part of coagulation. However, when it's bound to thrombomodulin, in the presence of protein C, the activity of this enzyme changes, and what it does is it just breaks down clotting factors into their degradation products. So clotting factors are necessary for blood clotting, and so if you're breaking down these clotting factors, then there's less clotting factors and no clotting in areas where there are healthy endothelial cells. In other words, no vessel damage. Also, this antithrombin-3 will actually stick to healthy endothelial cells because these endothelial cells have a, a carbohydrate polymer that's in their membrane called heparin. 
Heparin is an anticoagulant, and the way it works is heparin is anchored in the plasma membrane of these endothelial cells. This enzyme called antithrombin-3 likes to stick to heparin, and when it binds to heparin, it becomes maximally activated. And what its activity is, is to degrade clotting factors into their degradation products. So we have two things right here in areas where you have healthy endothelial cells that break down clotting factors. And so in areas where healthy endothelial cells exist, no vessel injury, we have no clotting, no coagulation, okay? So basically, we have mechanisms to keep the blood vessel dilated, we have mechanisms to inhibit platelet aggregation, and mechanisms to inhibit clotting. But this all changes whenever we have damage to the vessel. And so what I've tried to indicate here is we now have damage to the vessel in this area, okay? Now, just know that in this area, before there was damage, we had all of these mechanisms going on. So before there was damage here, there would have been this enzyme NTP deace one there would have been nitric oxide and prostacycline being released, and then antithrombin-3 and thrombomodulin, all this. That would have been in this area. However, when this area of the vessel is damaged, all that stuff goes away. And really, just in this vicinity, locally that is, we have changes. Now, the first thing that's going to happen is what's called a vascular spasm. This is a myogenic mechanism, so it's an intrinsic property of the blood vessel walls. So whenever there is vessel injury right here, the smooth muscle that's actually deep to the endothelial cells, the smooth muscle in this area is going to sense the damage through nerves, and it's going to constrict. And so you're going to get vasoconstriction. Sometimes this is referred to as a myogenic mechanism. Okay, so we constrict the vessel really just in this area. We're not gonna constrict it down here or way up here at the top, really just locally in the area where we have the damage. So we're gonna basically constrict the blood vessel so that we don't get as much blood flowing through here at first, okay? So we have vasoconstriction. And so this myogenic mechanism, this intrinsic property of the vessel via the smooth muscle to constrict, that is what is referred to as vascular spasm. And so, in addition to the intrinsic property of the vessel, there's also damaged endothelial cells that are going to release chemicals that further vasoconstrict to prevent as much blood from going through that area because we don't want to lose blood. One of those chemicals is called endothelin. Now, I know I have it shown here from what appears to be a healthy endothelial cell, but really it's the damaged endothelial cells that release this chemical called endothelin. Endothelin can bind to smooth muscle receptors and it will promote vasoconstriction, really just in areas where you have the damage. So we have a myogenic mechanism and we have endothelin. So we get vasoconstriction. These two things combined are called the vascular spasm, okay? Now the second thing that's gonna have is we're gonna have what's called formation of a platelet plug, okay? So what we have to do is we have to have platelets that come over here where the injury is, and they just block it, basically. So initially, we'll have a few platelets that come, and then more platelets, and it's a positive feedback cycle. We get more and more and more platelets to wall off that area, at least before we can get the blood clot. So the platelets aggregating are not the blood clot. They're just really posing a physical barrier, more or less. But we're going to see that they're going to initiate part of coagulation, okay? So how do platelets know when to stick here? Well, first of all, in the area where we have vessel damage, we're gonna have a buildup of ADP, right? Because in this damaged area, we no longer have this enzyme that's gonna break down ADP. So the first signal that's gonna cause these platelets to sort of stick together is gonna be ADP, all right? Uh, we're also not going to have nitric oxide or prostacycline in this area, and so the lack of those is also going to further trigger these uh, platelets to stick together, all right? But one of the biggest factors that's really going to cause the platelet to stick to the wall right here, but the initial signal that's going to trigger these platelets to stick to the vessel wall where it's injured is this protein called von Willebrand factor, abbreviated VWF. All right, so in the area where we have vessel damage, we're now going to have exposed extracellular matrix. So the underlying connective tissue is going to be exposed now to the blood. And what protein do we have a huge amount in the extracellular matrix in connective tissue? 
the structural protein collagen. So we're going to have collagen now exposed to the blood. So there's this protein, von Willebrand factor, that's normally circulating in the blood. And when it comes over here, it's going to be able to bind to collagen, okay, the collagen of the extracellular matrix. And so you're going to get a bunch of von Willebrand factors that are going to stick right here on the exposed collagen. And so on one side, the von Willebrand factor is going to stick to the collagen of the extracellular matrix, as you see right here. But on the other end, the von Willebrand factor is going to stick to the platelet. Okay? Now platelets normally express this receptor in their membrane called glycoprotein 1B, or GP1B. This is actually a receptor in the membrane of platelets that actually binds to von Willebrand factor. And so hopefully you can kind of see what's going on here. We have the injury site with exposed extracellular matrix with collagen linked to von Willebrand factor, which is then linked to the receptor here on the platelet. And so this is really how the platelets start to stick to this area. Now, as soon as this platelet uh, binds to von Willebrand factor, this glycoprotein 1B is going to change conformation. Not only is it going to stick here, but it's going to change conformations and initiate a series of activities inside the platelet. Okay. This is going to trigger platelet aggregation. Okay. So the initial sticking of the platelet just to the vessel wall where it was damaged, that's just called platelet adhesion. So when the platelet sticks to the damaged area, that's called platelet adhesion. Platelet aggregation is when a platelet sticks to another platelet. Okay? And so what happens is when this binds to von Willebrand factor, some enzymes become activated. So in the membrane of this cell, the platelet, there's arachidonic acid in the membrane. And so there's an enzyme called phospholipase A2 that's going to remove arachidonic acid from the membrane and convert it ultimately into a prostaglandin. This is done through the enzyme cyclooxygenase. Okay? And then once you have this prostaglandin called PGH2, it's then converted to a thromboxane, thromboxane A2, through the action of thromboxane synthase. And once TXA2 or thromboxane A2 is made, it's then released into the blood. And so in the vicinity of this platelet where the concentration of thromboxane A2 is the highest, other platelets are going to stick to this platelet. Okay, so thromboxane A2 is going to trigger activation of this platelet, okay, and it's going to do so basically through six mechanisms, okay. Thromboxane A2 is going to trigger this platelet to become activated, so when it does, this platelet releases serotonin. Serotonin further augments platelet aggregation. Serotonin will also um, activate platelets in addition to thromboxane A2. So you get more platelets being activated. You can see how this is positive feedback. Also, this platelet will start releasing more ADP. That furthers platelet aggregation as well. This platelet will also release calcium. Calcium ions are important for coagulation, which we're going to see in some of the next videos. Okay? Also, this platelet can release some clotting factors. One of the clotting factors that it will actually release is something called factor 12, which is also commonly called Hageman factor. Um, it can release some others as well, but it will further release clotting factors to help clot the blood. And then it will also release platelet-derived growth factor. So, once you actually form this platelet plug through platelet adhesion and platelet aggregation, you also have to heal the contents of this vessel, the connective tissue and all that that's become exposed. And so this platelet-derived growth factor is going to stimulate the healing process for this connective tissue. And you can see here added collagen fibers. It's going to stimulate the repair of that tissue, so vessel healing. And then to kind of lead us into the next video, where we talk about the coagulation cascades, these platelets also secrete something called polyphosphate. Now, polyphosphate is really just this weird uh, polymer of phosphate molecules. And what they do is they serve to activate some of the clotting factors. In particular, as we're going to see uh, in the next video, the polyphosphate that's released by this platelet will actually activate factor 12, or Hagen factor. And this actually initiates what's called the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. Okay? And so that's going to be the next step. After we form the platelet plug to basically seal off the injury site so blood can't escape, 
we're going to further augment that and make sure no blood can escape by forming a clot. And that clot formation is done through the process of coagulation, of which there are two branches, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. So that's what we're going to cover in the next video. All right. So hopefully this video made sense and it gave you a good understanding of what happens in a normal healthy blood vessel and then what happens when we have vessel injury and hopefully you understand what platelets are actually doing to adhere and then also to aggregate together. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. As I mentioned in the next video, we're going to discuss coagulation. Thank you.